questions. The next item of business is a statement by Michael Russell on an update on negotiations on the European Union Withdrawal Bill. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so uh, if any member wishes to ask a question, I would encourage you to press your request to speak buttons now. And I call on the Minister, Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And with your permission, I want to update Parliament on the negotiations that have been taking place between the Scottish Government, the Welsh Government and the UK Government on the issue of the EU Withdrawal Bill. These have become particularly intense over the past few weeks. The JMC EN met on the 8th of March and the plenary met on the 14th of March. I spoke to David Liddington on the phone on the 29th of March, on the 6th of April and again last Saturday. I met with David Liddington and Mark Drakeford last Monday. I spoke to Mark Drakeford several times in March and on Friday and Monday. I also wrote to Mr Liddington on Friday and my officials have been in almost constant contact with Welsh and UK officials in the last month. I expect to meet with Mr Liddington and Professor Drakeford again next week. Accordingly, much effort has gone into and will continue to go into seeking and if at all possible achieving an agreed approach to the problems presented for the devolved administrations by the EU withdrawal bill and the Brexit process. Presiding officer, whenever this chamber discusses Brexit, we should always of course remember that the people of Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU. There were majorities to remain in every single local authority area. And the Scottish Government remains as committed as ever to EU membership. This week we've had yet more evidence of the unfolding disaster and confusion that is Brexit. The Prime Minister's refusal to countenance continued membership of the Customs Union, despite the evidence from her own government of the damage that will cause, is a result of the internal tensions in her own party. It has nothing to do with the best interest of any part of the country she's meant to serve. Terrifyingly and appallingly, jobs, living standards, even the Good Friday Agreement are all secondary concerns for the hard Brexiteers who now have the whip hand in Downing Street and seemingly for those Tory ministers who put their jobs before the livelihoods and future of their fellow citizens. Now many I know were strongly of the view that because of our country's democratic opposition to Brexit and particularly the hard Brexit currently favoured by the UK government that this parliament and this government would have been entirely justified in taking a political decision to have nothing to do with the EU withdrawal bill. And of course, as I've told the Parliament in a previous statement, there was no consultation on the content of the bill prior to us seeing it in finished form. Moreover, when we did see the bill, it was clear that what was envisaged was nothing less than a crude power grab on the powers of the Scottish people as exercised by this, their Scottish Parliament. And yet, however much we disagree with leaving the EU, regrettably, legal preparations must be made for EU withdrawal, which is what the withdrawal bill seeks to achieve. Even if at the 11th hour we were able to avoid Brexit, that would still be the case. So the huge time-consuming task of ensuring the UK's and Scotland's statute book can function properly following EU withdrawal is a necessary one. And this Scottish Government has risen to the task. Working with others, different political parties, governments of different political persuasions, communities and interest groups across Scotland, we've all striven to achieve a better, more acceptable bill. We've undertaken that work with only one absolute red line, which is this. All the preparations for Brexit can and must be done in a way that builds on and is consistent with the principles of devolution. Principles that were endorsed overwhelmingly by the people of Scotland in the 1997 referendum. Now that can't come as a surprise to anyone. We've repeatedly made this point over many months. We said it in December 2016 in Scotland's place in Europe. We made the point in private to the UK government before the withdrawal bill was even introduced. And we set it out in detail in September 2017 in the legislative consent memorandum for the bill. The Scottish Parliament has also on this issue spoken as one, and its voice has been heard more powerfully because of that unity. In its interim report on the bill, the Finance and Constitution Committee unanimously called the approach of the bill incompatible with the devolution settlement in Scotland. Clause 11, in particular, they warned, would adversely effect, impact on the intelligibility and integrity of the devolution settlement and was a fundamental shift in the structure of devolution in Scotland. Let me focus on the precise words of the committee report for a second. What does it mean to say that the approach of the UK government is incompatible with the devolution settlement? Well, it means that Clause 11 subverts the principles of that settlement Principles which have given the people of Scotland a stable and effective parliament for nearly 20 years, supported by all parties in this place, 
and which has throughout that time secured good government under different administrations and in response to many difficult political challenges. The presiding officer at the very heart of these principles is this non-negotiable truth. Changes to the devolution settlement require the agreement of the Scottish Parliament. It is the foundation stone of Section 30 of the Scotland Act 1998 itself, under which orders adjusting the list of matters reserved to the UK Parliament must be approved, not simply in Westminster, but here as well. The Scottish Government intends to protect this essential principle of devolution. But before I turn on how we will do so, I want to indicate those matters on which we have made negotiating progress, and I'm pleased to say there are quite a few of them. I pay tribute to the work of David Lidington and Mark Drakeford, to our respective officials, and to those in this Parliament who have supported and helped the process which has been strengthened by having substantial cross-party support. I thank a number of members of the House of Lords, and especially Lord Hope and Lord Mackay of Clash Fern, who have shown a keen interest in this matter and have worked hard on it, as has Jim Wallace and David Steele and David Wigley. Mark Drakeford and I, in our conversation yesterday, confirmed that we would continue, going forward, to work together on these and all the other Brexit issues and concerns we have in common. Together with the UK government, we agreed that there is an important and difficult job to be done in preparing our laws for EU withdrawal. We are agreed that ideally it would be done on a UK-wide basis, through cooperation and collaboration between the governments of these islands. We are agreed that on leaving the EU, it could make sense for there to be common frameworks applying across the UK in some areas formerly covered by common EU rules. Where those frameworks are in Scotland's interest, the Scottish Government is ready to discuss them. We have identified 24 areas where we should be able to work together on the basis of consent from all the governments involved. The Secretary of State for Scotland has also said, both to the UK Parliament and here, that frameworks should not be imposed on the devolved administrations. We agree with that as well. So these points, taken together with the principles of devolution, are the basis of something that this government could consider recommending to Parliament. But the key sticking point remains, as it always has been, Clause 11 and the insistence of the UK government on its right to take control of devolved powers. Let me set out to Parliament where we are at present on that issue. Tomorrow, we expect the UK government to publish further amendments to Clause 11. We have given them serious and respectful consideration, but we as a government are absolutely and unanimously clear that we cannot support any proposal that would enable the powers of the Scottish Parliament to be constrained without the agreement of the Scottish Parliament. And the UK government's latest proposals continue to give Westminster the power to prevent the Scottish Parliament from passing laws in certain devolved policy areas. And while we expect the amendments to include the addition of a sunset clause, the restrictions on the use of these our powers would last for up to seven years. The UK government says this ban or legal constraint needs to be in place to prevent the Scottish Parliament from legislating in devolved matters, such as farming or fishing, while framework discussions are taking place. But it has never proposed and has indicated it could not accept such a legal constraint for England. Any constraint placed on the UK government will therefore be purely voluntary. Given the seemingly endless political uncertainty at Westminster, who can say what a future Prime Minister or UK government will choose to do in the future? But during the period of restraint, the Scottish Parliament will lack the ability to ensure that our laws in these areas, environmental protection for example, can keep pace with EU law. And during the same period, Westminster politicians, or those that replace them of whatever political or constitutional hue, will have a totally free hand to pass legislation directly affecting Scotland's fishing industry, our farmers, our environment, our public sector procurement rules, the safe use of chemicals, our food safety, the list is long, while our Parliament's hands would be tied. It's also worth noting that while discussion and political agreement may have reduced the number of areas that may be subject to such restrictions to 24, under the UK government's proposals there will be nothing on the face of the bill that limits possible restrictions to these areas. Again, we're being asked to take that on trust. How could we recommend giving consent to a bill that would place Scotland in such a vulnerable position in these uncertain political times? Now, in an effort to allay our concerns, we understand that the UK government may also propose a further political commitment to effect that it will not normally make these regulations without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. However, this would not form part of any legislative amendment. And in any event, if we agreed to this, the terms of the UK government approach mean it would still be for the UK government 
and ultimately the House of Commons to determine what is normal and what is not. It will also be for Westminster to decide whether the Scottish Parliament is acting reasonably on any occasion on which it opts to withhold consent. And in this respect, we can't forget that the UK government has gone out of its way during the Brexit process to remind people that it can legislate on any matter at any time. Indeed, in relation to the Sewell Convention, the UK government lawyers told the Supreme Court whether circumstances are normal is a quintessential matter of political judgment for the Westminster Parliament. So, presiding officer, let me cut to the chase. Notwithstanding the more benign language now being used, the effect of the UK government's latest proposals remains this. The Scottish Parliament's powers could be restricted for a period of up to seven years without its consent. Now, that is not something the Scottish Government could recommend the Parliament approves. But there is still a way forward. In fact, there are two possible ways forward, and I've outlined these to David Lidington. The First Minister has now outlined them to the Prime Minister today. The first is to simply remove Clause 11 from the Bill. Both the Scottish and UK governments could then agree on equal terms not to bring forward legislation in devolved policy areas while negotiations or frameworks are taking place. In fact, in that way, the Scottish Government is offering exactly the same certainty now being offered by the UK Government. And we could do so, as we have indicated, within a written and signed document which shows that neither side would unreasonably withhold agreement. We believe that if such a voluntary agreement is good enough for Westminster, it should also be good enough for Holyrood. This solution would also demonstrate equity of treatment in keeping with repeated assurances made to the people of Scotland during and after the 2014 referendum and as part of the 2016 referendum campaign. However, if the UK government rejects this reasonable proposal, then we have another one. We could agree to abide by the present system. In that system, any regulations preventing the Scottish Parliament from legislating and devolved matters for a temporary period of time must only be introduced when that is agreed by the Scottish Parliament. That means amendments to Clause 11 must make it clear that absolute Scottish Parliament consent is required. There must be no override power for UK ministers in the withdrawal bill. And that will be consistent with the way other order-making powers are currently exercised and with the devolution settlement and is a proposal we have repeatedly made to the UK government. Presiding officer, these are practical and workable solutions to the issue that will ensure the necessary preparation for Brexit can be taken across the UK whilst protecting devolution. They are both on offer. By continuing to work with the Welsh Government and the UK, we can make progress on them, but in the end, it will be for this Parliament to make the final decision. It is the Scottish Parliament which will give or withhold legislative consent to the UK-EU withdrawal bill. So later this week, following the lodging in Westminster of the UK Government's proposed amendments, the Scottish Government will lay in Parliament a supplementary legislative consent memorandum. In it, we will spell out in detail the Scottish Government's remaining concerns about the bill and suggest these options as a way forward. It will express our wish to come to an agreement with the UK Government. But it will also make it clear that if Clause 11 is not removed or if the necessary changes to Clause 11 are not made, then we will not recommend that Parliament consents to the EU withdrawal bill as a whole. It will also set out our view on other clauses, indicate what we could accept if agreement can be reached, and outline how we intend to proceed with the continuity bill, which we will defend vigorously in the courts. And at the end of this process, this Parliament will decide how it wants to proceed. It will then be for the UK Government and the UK Parliament to respond to that decision. They will have to do so by the third reading of the Bill in the Lords, the last opportunity to make any substantive changes to it in Westminster. That is what is required by our Constitution. No less an authority on the matter than Professor Tompkins has described the Sewell Convention in this chamber as a binding rule of constitutional behavior. Breach it, he warned, and there will be a high political price to pay. Indeed. It would be an outrage if the UK government decided to use what the people of Scotland did not vote for, Brexit, to undermine what we did vote for, devolution. The UK government has no mandate to undermine the powers of this parliament. And therefore, the Scottish Government will do everything we can to protect the devolution settlement people voted for so overwhelmingly more than 20 years ago. We want to agree with the UK Government and move this issue on so we can spend time on the substantive and dangerous challenges which Brexit presents more and more pressingly to this nation. But we can't agree at any price. 
and certainly not at the price of undermining this parliament and the essential work it does for all the people of Scotland. Thank you, and I call on Adam Tompkins to be followed by Neil Finlay. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement. It's deeply disappointing that the Minister has come to this chamber without a deal today. Uh, as he knows, we on these benches have been critical of the process around Clause 11 since last summer. But the United Kingdom government has, in recent weeks, stepped up the pace, listened to the concerns that were raised, and has come forward with a new offer which it will publish tomorrow. Yet, it would appear, for narrow political reasons, the SNP once again says no. <laughs> Presiding officer, this, it seems, has nothing to do with the matter at hand and everything to do with their obsession with a second referendum on independence. Yes. So can the minister confirm the following two points? In his statement, he claims that he is still working together with the Welsh government. Has he been informed of the Welsh government's view of the new proposed amendments to Clause 11, or have they kept him out of the loop? Last September, the minister, Mr. Russell, said, and I quote, we cannot envisage a situation in which Scotland would be content and Wales not be, or vice versa. Has anything changed, or is that still his position? And secondly, isn't it the case that he, in fact, was prepared to sign up to this deal today, but was overruled last week by the First Minister? Isn't it the case that when it comes to consent, he was prepared to give it, but she refused? Michael Russell. Well, let me respond to three points, not uh, just the two questions. On the first point, there's nothing narrow about standing up for the powers of this parliament. That actually is what we were all elected to do. And uh, the heart of this matter is very simple. The issue at stake has uh, been boiled down to its irreducible minimum, and that is this, that we can consent and move forward by consent or we can be refused the opportunity to consent. Now, the offer is on the table. I've made it very clear there are two options in here, neither of which, either of which we would accept. And I make that absolutely clear, either of which we would accept. But there has to be a decision by the UK government to respect the devolution of the settlement. That is non-negotiable. Now, to address the two points, uh, it is up to the Welsh government to say what their position would be. And I have discussed... And it is up to the Welsh Government to say, but I have discussed these matters over a range of days and a range of opportunities with Mark Drakeford. And as I said in my statement, the thing that we agreed last night, actually at 25 past five last night, when I was on a Calmac ferry on the way back from Mull, what we agreed last night was no matter the decision of either government, and we're entitled to make it, we would go on working together on the key issues that confront both administrations for Brexit. So there are some things that rise above the narrow political advantage of the Tories in Brexit. And the thing that rises above it is the work that the Welsh Government and we will do to defend the devolved settlements. And we'll go on doing that together. Now, as for the final question, clearly Mr. Uh, Mr. Tompkins is not close to what is being taken place. Because anybody who is close to what is taking place would know precisely, and he is, he is clearly not close to what's taking place, would know that the situation as we, we left it and as I left it with, uh, with David Lidington in our conversation on Saturday is that uh, we cannot move forward on the basis of lack of consent for the Scottish Parliament. I stand four square behind that position. As I indicated, so does the entire government. There is no crack in that. Either, either, and, and either, every member of this chamber stands four square behind that, or you'd have to ask, what are they doing here? Neil Finlay to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Neil Finlay. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of the statement. Um, all through this process, Scottish Labour has worked with others to try and bring about a resolution to the uh, disagreements around the devolution of powers after Brexit. Um, that's because we believe in devolution. And the Commons, Leslie Laird put forward amendments in the House of Commons that would have resolved the situation, and disgracefully Tory MPs were whipped to oppose them. Early on in the process, we proposed standstill agreements and a, sun uh, and a sunset clause, but the Cabinet Secretary was dismissive of this approach until the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary later went on to propose the very same. All along, we've taken the Cabinet Secretary at face value. Uh, me and my colleagues, we've worked with him on the continuity bill. Uh, 
he has, up until today, shared information on latest developments and negotiations. But today, alas, no phone calls, no texts, no briefings, no nothing. So all we have to do is, all we have today is to go on this statement. So can I begin by acknowledging and welcoming the progress made on a range of issues? It's clear, as we have asked all along, that the three governments have worked constructively to find some compromise on some of the key issues and progress has been made and that is welcome. But ultimately, we don't have an agreement. So can I ask again uh, if the Scottish Government's position is shared by the Government of Wales? Is there an ag no agreement there too? What will happen if the Scottish Government's continuity bill is struck down by the Supreme Court? Where does that leave us? What scope is there for further last minute progress? And picking up on uh, Mr Tompkins' point, which I, I didn't know, but clearly from today, the body language, but lack of real language between the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister would suggest <laughs> that a deal... Oh, now they're all pals. Yeah. Now they're all pals. Yeah. That would suggest, <laughs> that would suggest that there was potentially a deal to be struck and the Cabinet Secretary wanted to sign it, but it's been kiboshed yeah. by the First Minister. And is it, is it his opinion? Didn't deny it. Is it his opinion? Didn't deny it. Is it his opinion that the Scottish Government should have an absolute Didn't veto at all times? President Officer, I hope that the Cabinet Secretary and First Minister are not playing political games here uh, with another round of constitutional politicking because that would be a betrayal of the good faith that we have invested in this process. What? So to paraphrase the Cabinet Secretary in his statement, it would be an outrage for the Scottish Government to use the devolution that the Scottish people did vote for to pursue independence that the Scottish people didn't vote for. Minister. I, uh, I'm grateful for you have to see a new side of Neil Finlay today. I didn't realise he was a man of such sensitivity that his antennae could tell him instantly what the state of the relationship was between myself and the First Minister, or indeed anybody else, presumably. <laughs> uh, I can assure you that the relationship with the First Minister seems fine to me, and I think it seems fine to her too. The reality of this situation, the reality of this situation is clear. Uh, what we need to know from Mr Finlay, and it didn't arise in his question, no doubt because he was too busy carefully staring at us to work out whether uh, the First Minister and I were inching together or inching apart, he didn't actually tell us any stage whether he would stand up for the rights of the Scottish Parliament and oppose the imposition. And if he is indicating, as he is indicating, he's willing to do so, I'm very glad about that because I want to continue to work with everybody on these issues because the core issue is very, very clear. Notwithstanding the more benign language that uh, is sometimes used from Westminster, there is a clear issue in here. Is the Scottish Parliament going to consent or is it not going to be asked for its consent? Is, are those restrictions going to last for seven years or are we going to have a voluntary working together? Now, as far as the uh, issue of the Supreme Court is concerned, we will vigorously defend our legislation, legislation which he, I am glad to acknowledge, voted for. And the chamber voted for by 95 votes to 32. We believe that that legislation is not only justifiable but necessary, and we will stick with it. And in terms of working with the Government of Wales, we will go on doing so. I repeat what I, I repeat the conversation I had with Mark Drakeford last night. Whatever the decision of the Government of Wales, whatever the decision of the Government of Scotland, we will continue to stand together on the issues of defending devolution and will continue to ensure that our interests are defended in this process. So we will go on doing that and I'm sure that Neil Finlay will not wish to drive us apart from the Labour government in Wales. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Tavish Scott. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've repeatedly said how sceptical I am that the UK government would back down from its power grab approach uh, and rather rather than those MSPs who seem eager to sign off a deal which undermines devolution, I believe that MSPs of all political parties should be resolute. Members of this parliament should not be undermining this parliament or going along with a Brexit power grab, which does so. But the, the minister says, the minister says the, the UK government has no mandate to undermine the powers of the Scottish Parliament, and that's absolutely right. But surely there is also now a bigger question. Is it not time, with all that we now know about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, about the anonymous Tory donors 
ch channeling their money through the DUP and back again to avoid <coughs> transparency rules, uh, and indeed about the whistleblower revelations about the illegal coordination between different parts of the Leave campaign. Is it not time to say that the entire EU referendum result is in question and there is no safe mandate for the UK to leave the European Union? Minister. I have the greatest sympathy for that point of view. The fact that there was... Well, well the fact that there's all this hollow laughter from the Tories, it strikes me that it's the air of nervous last, laughter reality because they are, they are being caught out. They are being caught out in what was a shabby, unpleasant campaign and with a result which does not have, and this is really vitally important, this result does not have the agreement of the people of Scotland. And this is Scotland's Parliament. That may come as a surprise to the Tories, but this is Scotland's Parliament. And therefore, it is vital. there were one or two members on the Tory benches who were, who were supporting Brexit. That was a reasonable and honourable position. But there were members on the Tory benches who the day after the result, the day after result, were clamouring to stay in the single market and the customs union and who are now running away from it as fast as possible. That does not strike me as principled politics and it does not strike me that it is honest to the people whom they represent. Now, Mr Harvey is absolutely correct to, to raise these issues. But it's equally important that we try and separate out, as this government has tried to separate out from the beginning, the issues of making sure there is a statute book prepared for Brexit, hopefully it will not happen, but prepared for Brexit, and the issue of opposing Brexit. We continue to oppose Brexit, but we have tried, we continue to try, to get the statute book into the right condition so that it is ready. And we stand ready to do so in the terms of the proposals I have laid out here today. And I would commend anybody who has influence with the UK government. I don't know if anybody has influence with the UK government. It strikes me the Prime Minister doesn't listen to anybody but herself. But if anybody has influence with the UK government, then make sure they understand, make sure they understand that these two offers are offers which we are happy to accept and which will conclude this matter. Tavish Scott to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I also thank the uh, Minister for uh, the copy of his statement uh, in advance? Um, Mr. Russell's made much to this Parliament, indeed, in selling his approach of the very close working relationship between him and his Welsh counterpart, and indeed with the Welsh Government more generally. Indeed, he stressed that time and time again today. It now appears obvious the Welsh Government are going to accept the UK Government's amendments tomorrow. Uh, what will he do in those circumstances? What is now the difference between Cardiff and Edinburgh? Minister. Well, we, it is up to the Welsh Government, as I say, to say, I mean, I know uh, Mr Scott likes uh, hypothetical questions and I think he has a reputation for them in a previous uh, session of this Parliament. But I, I do want to go back to what I said in my statement about my discussions with Mark Drakeford, because they, it is absolutely clear, and both of us believe the same thing, that no matter the decisions that either side come to, there will be continued to have, and I, I quote again what I said, Mark Drayford and I, in our conversation yesterday, confirmed that we would continue going forward to work together on these and all the other Brexit issues and concerns that we have in common. That is the answer to the members' questions. We will continue to do that, no matter the position that either government take. But actually, also, no matter the position either parliament take. Because I've also stressed in this statement very clearly that the decision on the, le the, the supplementary legislative consent memorandum will come to this parliament and it will be for Parliament to take a position on that. And we will lay out in greater detail the things I've indicated today, and then the Parliament will have a choice. But I, I have also indicated early on in the statement I expect to meet with uh, Mr. Lennington and Professor Drakeford next week, and we will continue in those discussions. And the view in, in those meetings has also been that if we could get a Northern Ireland Assembly up and running, if we could overcome the historic mistake from the Tories, of relying on DUP votes, which has made that ever more unlikely. If we could overcome that, then we might also be able to have four nations sitting at those tables and trying to find a way forward on the basis of consent. And I go back to that point, on the basis of consent. That is the issue which we're addressing in here, and that's the issue we need to get resolved. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister please confirm that I have the correct understanding of what he set out in his statement? Am I correct that the UK Government are proposing that there are a different set of rules for the UK compared with here at Holyrood in regard to some areas of devolved powers? Am I further correct that they are proposing 
that the, the Holyrood would be bound by UK statute from acting in these devolved powers for at least seven years, whereas the UK government will not be similarly constrained and have asked us to trust them that they will not seek to change any devolved powers in these areas. Do you believe that this proposal upholds a central principle of devolution, because this is what this is all about, that Holyrood should always give its consent to changes in devolved powers being proposed by the UK government? Minister. Well, Mr Crawford puts it pithily and succinctly as ever. That is exactly the situation. We are being asked to agree to something and to accept legislative constraint upon us in these areas for a period of seven years, but there will be no equivalent legislative constraint on the UK uh, Parliament or government. Uh, and that is exactly what they are saying. And uh, I have to say that although I'm a very trusting individual, I do think in these circumstances, trust should go both ways. Exactly. So what we are saying is, if that is the relationship that you want to have, then you trust us and we'll trust you. And that is, I would have thought, a very reasonable way of going ahead. If you trust us and we trust you, and we write that down, and we're quite prepared to put it in a written agreement, then we'll have the basis of moving forward. So uh, I think that's something which most people will look at and say, if that's how a deal should be done, do it. Jackson Carlo to be followed by June McAlpine. Um, the atmosphere is clearly heightened, but can I implore ministers to do all they can to work to secure an agreement until the very last minute? Not, frankly, on the basis of late and random proposals made now, but on the basis of the working amendment on offer. The minister has spelled out this afternoon the concessions that the UK government has made, but he hasn't spelled out what the concessions have been that the Scottish government has made in this process. Will he do so? And given that he, Ash Denham, Stuart Macmillan, all made their interventions in the last statement, absolutely fundamentally on the basis that the lockstep approach with Wales was fundamental to challenging the impression that there was anything here that could evidence a constitutional obsession with the Scottish Government. What will ordinary Scots now make of the fact that if Wales does agree, it is Scotland alone that is now standing against an agreement clearly in the interests of the whole of the United Kingdom? Minister. Well, you know, the, the member started well with an appeal to reason, but he didn't finish very well. Um, let me make this... I think ordinary people will look at this Parliament and say, we elected the members of this Parliament to stand up for Scotland. That's what we're here for. Yeah. And in those circumstances, those members that are prepared to stand up for Scotland, they're prepared to say that the people who voted for uh, the devolved Parliament have the right to be listened to, and the people who did not vote for Brexit have the right to be listened to. Uh, but also they will look at us and say, this is a government that is offering a compromise, because it, the compromise that's being offered is absolutely clear. The compromise that's being offered is absolutely clear. We are prepared, we are prepared, we are prepared to voluntarily restrict our, the way in which we operate, the powers that we have, as long as the UK government agree to their own voluntary restriction, and they will both have given up substantive amounts in order to come to a fair agreement about how we would operate. That is a massive concession. I have to say at the beginning of this process, as I said in my statement, we'd have been quite entitled, given the way that we've been treated, given the way that this legislation came about, given what's in this legislation, to throw our hands up and say enough is enough. We're not going to be treated in this way. But I have to say that painstakingly, over many, many months, we've worked on these issues. We got to the list of 24 eventually. After a lot of work, we got the acceptance of the, the, the principles on which we would make that, draw up that list eventually. And we've now got to the stage where there is a very clear choice. So I agree with Mr. Carlo. Let's not uh, hype this up in the way that uh, Mr. Tompkins was hyping it up at the beginning. Let's keep it nice and calm. Because what we've got here, what we've got here, well, some of the toys can't do that, but I can do it. Let's try and keep this nice and calm. You see, I'm afraid they're not up to this challenge, but I'll give it a third shot. I'll give it a third shot. Let's keep this nice and calm. We've made a, an offer of a choice and the UK government now has the opportunity to respond to that. I would urge them to be calm. They're usually calmer than the Scottish Tories. Be calm, look at the choice you've got, and let's come to the voluntary agreement which we need to get. Thank you. Can I also urge all members and ministers to be succinct with the next few questions and answers? June McAlpine to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you very much. The minister has made it clear that the Scottish Parliament could be prevented from legislating in a wide range of devolved areas for shockingly up to seven years. 
What impact does he think this could have on vital Scottish interests, particularly in the context of trade deals being struck after Brexit? Minister. The issue of trade deals is clearly very much on people's minds. I mean, the, the, the issue of the much talked about, but fortunately so far never eaten, chlorinated chicken comes to mind. That there are a whole range of food safety issues, for example, which could simply be imposed upon Scotland and we would have no possibility of resisting them. Um, and this is, uh, we go into other areas, environmental areas, into uh, the administration and, and, and development of agricultural policy, of fishing, a whole range of things that give us very serious cause of concern. And that's only with the present UK government. I know it's always a very foolish thing to say things couldn't get worse, but my experience in politics is they often can. And can you imagine a Boris Johnston government, a Rees Mogg government? And it's that, I know that sounds ridiculous, but we live in a very bizarre world. Can you imagine that? And what they, that type of government might want to do and, and would be able to do because the Scottish Parliament could not stop them doing that. And if that does not concentrate minds in this chamber, I don't know what would. James Kelly is followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister what would be the legal standing of the supplementary LCM he proposes if the challenge in the courts to the EU continuity bill was successful? Minister. I think that's a question which I would want to seek opinion on uh, because I don't think I'm in a position to give a legal opinion and I don't think I should give a legal opinion. Um, I think the, the situation is that we will proceed to defend the continuity bill as we believe the bill is entirely within the competence of this parliament. Um, and we are also you know, obviously in a position where we will bring the legislative, supplementary legislative consent memorandum. It will go to the committee of which I think Mr. Kelly is, is still a member, the Finance and Constitution Committee. There will be, I'm sure, a searching examination of it. Uh, and then it will be up to the chamber to decide what to do. Um, but I, I don't really want to be in the position of giving Mr. Kelly a legal opinion. I know he can get some of those closer to home, but I, uh, I don't really think that I should do that. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Maurice Golden. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, Officer. Well, the Minister has indicated earlier on that uh, this isn't the end of the process. Uh, what, so what remaining opportunities are there for the UK Government to put this right and amend their bill to ensure it respects this Parliament? Minister. There remains the, the time for them to do so in the House of Lords at the third reading, which uh, is presently scheduled, I understand, for the middle of May, though that timetable, of course, can always slip. Um, we would like to have seen this resolved uh, earlier, but we can't resolve it on the basis of the present um, um, uh, discussions. Uh, I think it's quite clear we have made substantial progress and there has been give on both sides. But this is a fundamental point. And we can't work our way round fundamental points. I know that is something that uh, the UK government keeps trying to do. This is a fundamental point that we have to address. Uh, and therefore, we are placing it here very clearly. But we could resolve this this afternoon. The, the First Minister has written to the Prime Minister uh, and has said this is a choice that we think needs to be made. If the Prime Minister were to come back and choose either of those options, then it would be resolved. So there is time to do that, and I hope we're able to do it. Horace Golden to be followed by Ash Denham. Did the First Minister overrule the Minister on making a deal? Minister? No. no. Ash Denham to be followed by Neil Bibby. This statement clearly revolves around the significant issues that are remaining over Clause 11, but the Minister in his statement outlined um, that there have been progress in other areas of the withdrawal bill. Could the Minister outline what those areas are and um, whether they now meet the approval of the Scottish Government? Minister. I listed a, a whole range of these areas in my statement. I won't go back through them. But I, I did say that at the, um, in the conclusion of my statement, I said that we will bring forward a, a supplementary legislative consent memorandum later this week. Uh, it will outline in more detail these matters and uh, will indicate what we propose to do about them. But uh, I, I think it's, it's right to focus, and I'd encourage people to focus on the issue of Clause 11. Uh, I think everything else is, is, is absolutely secondary now in these circumstances. It is Clause 11 that is the issue that requires still to be resolved. So we need to focus on Clause 11. We need to find a resolution to it. Neil Bibby, to follow by Ivan McKee. Um, I welcome and acknowledge the progress that has been made, but I also have to express disappointment and frustration that all these months later we still don't have a deal. The Minister will know that I have pressed the case for the use of standstill agreements and sunset clauses. And he will recall that Nicola Sturgeon and Carwin Jones wrote jointly 
offering a sunset clause as a potential solution to clause 11. We now see a sunset a question, clause. Please, Mr. Baby. We now see a sunset clause on the table, but the minister appears to be objecting to it lasting up to seven years. Can I ask the minister to clarify? Does he have a specific objection to up to seven years? And if so, what time frame would be acceptable to the Scottish Government? Minister. It is a combination of the time and the lack of consent that are the issues. If you, you, a sunset clause is obviously useful to have, and we've never opposed it, but we've, we've been doubtful about it because it is the issue of consent that is more important. The issue of consent remains at the centre of these concerns. Um, you know, the member says that he is frustrated there is no solution. I'm frustrated there is no solution. You know, it, just to, to be entirely blunt about it, you know, I could probably do without commuting backwards and forwards to London to have these discussions. I could probably do without late Saturday afternoon discussions with David Liddington. I'm frustrated too, but my job is to make sure that I do not, that I do not sell the pass. And the pass here is to make sure that we defend the Scottish Parliament yeah, yeah. and the devolution settlement. And I absolutely will not sell the pass on those issues. Ivan McKee to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Uh, I thank the Minister for that statement, updating us on the negotiations. A key point, however, remains that we can't give up on the single market and the customs union despite the Tories' best attempts. Will the Minister continue to fight for a differentiated solution for Scotland that will protect jobs, living standards and our economy? Minister. Uh, yes, I will. And I think that the single market and customs union issue is vitally important. Um, I'm pleased to see that the position of the Labour Party has moved towards the customs union and I think there was some indication in Emily Thornberry's contributions over the weekend and, and yesterday that further movement was possible and I welcome that because I think single market membership and customs union membership are absolutely vital. So, of course, the UK government knows that because the UK government has its own figures and the UK government in undertaking the analysis which we have undertaken too has come to the conclusion that of the three options that exist, single market and customs union membership, a, a, a Canada plus type of deal and WTO, WTO rules deal, uh, even single market membership means that people are worse off but it's far, far better than the other two. Those are facts and those are known to the UK government. And what is the most astonishing thing is that a government that knows those things, ministers who know those things, are proceeding with a fantasy about some um, advantages that will exist in, in free trade deals elsewhere, when the figures show that is minuscule compared to the advantages of the existing customs union. I, I, I saw the Trade Secretary tweeting about this at the weekend. The Trade Secretary knows, he knows from those figures, that those free trade agreements do not produce anything like the advantages compared to the disadvantages of leaving the customs union. And I do find that, frankly, well, I think there's only one word for it, disgusting. Graeme Simpson to be followed by Clear Hockey. Um, last year, Mike Russell told the Finance and Constitution uh, Committee, and I quote, I cannot envisage a situation in which Scotland would be content and Wales would not be, or vice versa. Is that still his position? Minister. Mr. Simpson has asked a question that was asked about four questions ago, so I, I would, great, I would, uh, I would, uh, I think I would, I would respectfully suggest that he catches up. But uh, the situation, the situation is, as I have outlined it all afternoon, it's very strange that the, the Tories are so concerned with Wales. I can't remember Tories' concerns for Wales ever before. <laughs> Isn't that odd? But the reality of the situation is, it is up for the Welsh Government and the Welsh Parliament to make their decision. It's up to us. Mr Simmons is a member of the Scottish Parliament, I remind him. It is up to the Scottish Parliament to make decisions. But I also go back to a point that I've made many times, but I'm just going to make it again. It is absolutely clear from discussion between myself and Mr Drakeford uh, yesterday. As I said, I was speaking from a Calmac ferry from Mull, and I read the point again. We confirmed... <laughs> We confirmed, well, if you don't like the answer, you shouldn't ask the question so often. We confirmed that we would continue going forward to work together on these and on all the other Brexit issues and concerns we have in common. That was my answer 20 minutes ago. It was my answer 10 minutes ago. It's my answer now. And if Mr Simpson comes back to it tomorrow, it'll be my answer then. Clear hockey. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for the information already provided. But can he advise what assurances the Scottish Government received from the UK Government about how devolved governments will be consulted going forward? Minister. Well, that's the nub of the matter. Claire Hawkey has, has, has returned to. The nub of the matter is that uh, there could be consultation, but there certainly won't be a, a role for decision making. In other words, we we'll, might be asked our opinion. 
But if our opinion isn't what the UK government want, then it doesn't matter. And that's not how we can do business. That's not how any member of this parliament should be able to do business. We should be able to stand there uh, as equals, discussing these issues with other administrations and making sure we come to a common mind on them. That is mature politics, and that's what we should be doing. Thank you very much. And that concludes our ministerial statement and questions. We'll now move on to the National Plan for Gaelic. We'll just take a few moments for our members and the ministers to change seats.